I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 61. We're going to talk today with Nikon Ambassador Ron McGill, so stay tuned. First, though, remember, if you can't watch this live on our Facebook page, on the Understand Photography Facebook page, we're live at 4 o'clock on Fridays Eastern Time. But we also put this on YouTube, so do a search for our YouTube channel, The Understand Photography Show, or on iTunes. If you want to listen in the car, if you like podcasts, I'm a podcast listener myself. I like to listen while I do other things or drive. So it's called The Understand Photography Show. And while you're there, if you'll write us a review or subscribe to our channel, we really, really appreciate it. It helps us continue to do this work. So does shooting in the manual mode intimidate you? Well, it did to me. It took me, and I hate to admit this, but it took me three years to learn how to shoot in the manual mode when I started photography. In my defense, it was film and you couldn't just look at the back of the camera, but I just couldn't understand it. Well, once I understood it, it was easy. And so I can now teach somebody in two hours how to shoot, or less even, how to shoot in the manual mode. We have a class called the Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography. It's a live online class, so I'm teaching it with you. I'm checking your homework, everything like that. That starts this coming November 14th, so it's next week, next Tuesday. The Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography, you can find it on our website at understandphotography.com. You'll learn to shoot in manual. Second class is about composition. Third class is all about lighting, including flash photography. And then the fourth class, we call it the techie stuff because it's like metering modes and drive modes and focus modes and things like that, but you'll be ready for it by then. So it'll give you a good foundation in photography. So that is our online, our main online class. We also have some great software classes online, so check that out at understandphotography.com. And then come practice with us. We've got three trips coming up this season. Joe Fitzpatrick is leading our Everglades trip, which he does every January. It's January 25th through the 28th, 2018. And then Joe is leading a trip to the Forgotten Coast, which is the Apalachicola area in the Panhandle of Florida, which is amazing. I love that area. He's going to get a boat tour on dead lakes, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, that's April 16 to 20. And then I'm holding a ladies-only weekend here in Naples, Florida on May 4th through 6th. So again, everything's on our website, understandphotography.com. My guest today on episode 61 is Ron McGill. Ron is a wildlife expert and photographer. He's the communication director with Zoo Miami. So welcome. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks pleasure to be here. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for driving over. No, no worries. My pleasure. Thank Did you. Did you come up to Miami Trail? Came up the trail. It was beautiful. It was beautiful Amazed place. at how high the water was in the glades there. It's, it's really high. Yeah. We had a hurricane here. Did you know? Yeah. <laughs> pretty aware. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was beautiful. It's still, you know, still a lot of waiting birds. Uh, Fair amount of gators and I love the wildlife that. there is I nice. I love that drive. It's beautiful the day. drive. Absolutely. No, I did I, it at I, night once. I'm never doing it at night. Really? Again. Oh, like I, it I like it at night too. Yeah, the owls it's, and there's a lot of things that go on on the side of the road. Take yeah, it slow and. Yeah, you got to go pretty slow though. Yeah, no, you know, just take your time. Best know. time is actually like five o'clock in the morning, about seven o'clock at night. That's your best drive. Uh, yeah. I have to remember that. Yeah. But I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> I'm never doing that at night again. I was scared, and then your eyes start playing tricks on you, and the speed limit's only 45 anyway, right, at night? I don't know. On Tamiami Trail, I'm pretty uh, sure. It's really slow. 45? Yeah, you're mm. not paying attention. <laughs> I am, but it's to the animals, I guess, not to the signs. <laughs> yeah, well, you're smashing into my face. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. smashing <laughs> anything. I don't say that. So you're a zoologist. I am. I'm a natural zoologist by, by training. Okay, you know, so you went to college for that? University of Florida. Go Gators. And so then you started working at Zoo Miami. Right out of college. Right. Yeah, this is my 38th long year. Long time. 38th year at the zoo now. I started there as a zookeeper, became a lead keeper, became a senior keeper, became a zoological supervisor, assistant curator, and now this director of communications position, which is wow. a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, I'm living the dream. I tell people all the time, I'm kind of living a scam. You know, when you get paid to do things that people pay to do, it's not really a job. I've never really had to work a day in my life. That's awesome. Yeah. That's such. That's really awesome, especially for uh, being at the same place for that many years to be able to say that. That's because so it's cool. never the same every day. You know, as a yeah. little kid, understand, I was born in a small apartment in New York City. My father was a Cuban immigrant, came over here with pretty much nothing. My mother was the daughter of a Colombian and German immigrant. Um, my parents really had nothing. And I tell kids now, you know, 
Today, they're so lucky. There's this plethora of programming on television. You've got the National Geographic Channel, the uh, Animal Planet, the Discovery Networks. There's so many of these channels that have this great amount of great wildlife programming. When I was a kid, there was basically only one show, really two. You know, you had the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. Oh, yeah. It's a great show. Yeah. Um, I wasn't as much an ocean guy back then. I was living up in New York. But then there was the other one, was Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. That's the one I remember. And that was, you know, that was, that was my church. That was religion. That was every Sunday night at 7.30, right before the wonderful world of Disney, it came on the world, Wild Kingdom. And I remember watching that show, and we only had like a little 12-inch black and white television set oh back then, God. you know? And, and, and it was one of those things with those telescopic antennas that broke off after two weeks and used a coat hanger to yeah. get a better reception. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'd watch that show, and I would just dream about what that would look like, those things that I saw on that show, to look at these guys. You know, it was Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler, and I watched them out there, you know, tracking elephants in the Serengeti, you know, swimming with sea lions off the Galapagos, tracking tigers on elephant back in, in India, and I'm thinking, what must that be like? And I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be doing that. And I, and I mean, I'm one of those guys that has lived those dreams. I've, I've been able to travel around the world and do these things that I only dreamed about as a kid. That's awesome. Yeah. I love to hear that. The great American success story. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a lot of luck. I had parents who believed in me and always told me to believe in the things I, I, I wanted to do. I had great teachers. Um, I was not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. I mean, my <laughs> grades were not these straight A's. It wasn't, you know, um, but I, was, I really loved wildlife. I loved animals. I loved being outdoors. Even in New York when I lived in an apartment. I mean, my, my parents have uh, images of me, old 16, 8 millimeter films of me, you know, feeding the squirrels in the street and training oh, right. them to come eat on my hands and stuff like that. When I was like, you know, three, four, five years old. So wow. very early in life, I had this connection with animals. I loved them. Uh, you know, my mom would bring me to the Bronx Zoo on a regular basis. And uh, there was something that happened there. That, that's, that's something that is very special. And it made me feel very lucky that I was able to make that connection. Wow. So you knew that's what you wanted to do. You went to college. Why did you go to college in Florida? Well, because we moved down to Florida when I was 12. Oh. Yeah, we moved from New York. My father's dream was always to have a big piece of land. Uh, he came from Cuba where he was basically a farmer. Oh, uh, I was freezing it up there. Well, no, <laughs> not that. He loved it. You know, he was actually, he was actually a, a bartender at a very big club in New York. Okay. Um, but he moved down here to get a piece of land. They bought a piece of land. Back when they bought it, it was in the middle of nowhere, Booneyville. Um, to have an avocado and mango grove. That was oh. his dream. Oh. Um, so it was five acres. My father was a contractor, so he built our home. My mom designed it. My father built the house. And growing up there was amazing. It was, we had, you know, we had a couple of horses. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember going out, catching all kinds of snakes, everything from rat snakes to pygmy rattlesnakes. I, I, I chased owls. I remember owls. I'd go to their perches, and I'd collect all of their the pellets that they were regurgitate yeah. and dry them so out, look at all the skeletons inside yeah. of them and stuff like that. I mean, it's just fascination with nature. You know, I went out tracking possums and raccoons and even we had bobcats back then it was fantastic that's all changed a lot but that connection i was able to make i kind of i kind of feel badly for kids today because everybody seems to be married to their smartphone or to their computer or to their television set and people are forgetting what is right outside your backyard especially here in south florida yeah. this place is an amazing place everywhere you go you know it doesn't have to be where you're looking for florida panthers or or black bears i mean you can look for some of the coolest frogs some of the coolest insects turtles there's so much life all around us and I, I want to encourage kids, especially, to get out there and experience that. That's what I did as a kid. It, you know, it kept me healthy, it kept me busy, and it kept me out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So now, how, you're a zoologist, how did you become a Nikon ambassador? Well, how did that, how did this you come know, to be? I, as a zoologist, I did a lot of research. I, I wrote papers for publication in some of the, uh, you know, the research publications and mm -hmm. such. And I would submit the, the papers, and they said, oh, these are great, but can we have some photographs to go with them? And I said... Sure, you know, so I would co contact the stock agencies. Okay. And so I need a photograph of this or this or this. And then they'd show me how much it was. And I went, what? Are you out of your mind? For that kind of money, I'll buy my own camera. Uh -huh. And that's exactly what I did. I bought my own camera and I taught myself photography in the sense that I, I couldn't afford to go to classes or anything like that. Um, so what I did was what I think a lot of people do. You know, you get a lot of these publications, popular photography, um, you know, Shutterbug, things like that. And I started looking at and reading the articles. And another thing I started doing is they have these contests uh -huh. in these magazines, you know, your best shot, that kind of stuff. Oh, right, right, right. And I started saying, you know, let me start because photography is very subjective. That's for it's sure. It's incredibly subjective. Some people like something, some people like other things. And I would look at some of these winners of these contests in these magazines and I go, well, that's not so great. I could do that. I could do that, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I always look at something that if I can do it, it's not that great. That's yeah. the way I look at life. If I can do it, you know, it's like, I don't mean to offend anybody like this, but you know, you go to like, 
the Museum of Modern Art. I remember going to that in New York one year, and there was this huge white canvas with a black dot in the corner. And it was like $400,000. And oh. I go, what is this? This is the emperor's new clothes. This is, this is a joke. I can do that. Yeah. Okay? But I guess it's all interpretation. It's yeah. all the interest. You know, so what I did was I, I'm going to teach myself, and I just started taking photographs and teaching myself. Uh, it was harder for me than it is today because it was film. Yeah. You know, I'm I didn't have that, that, that immediate camera. teacher. Exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're, you're oh God, I wasted so much money in film. I would go out and I would shoot rolls and rolls of film and I'd come back and I'd tell I was just think, think, think. I'm throwing everything out. You know, it's just garbage. But now with digital photography, that's what I tell people all the time. God, this generation doesn't realize how lucky they are. Yeah. They, they have this instant gratification. You look at the back of your LCD, that's, that's the greatest teacher you have right there. Because there are people who can teach you certain things and do certain... But at the end of the day, what I tell people all the time is, the first person who, likes, who has to like the photograph is you. Yeah. If you don't like your own photograph, it doesn't really matter what anybody else thinks. And, and, and I've seen that in so many instances where things that people used to say were garbage, now all of a sudden it's the new thing. It's, oh my God, that's the way you have to shoot. You know, uh, the, the greatest so example. so true. <laughs> oh God. The greatest example of that was like, you know, everything used to have to be tack sharp. Everything was sharp. Corner to corner, tack sharp. If it wasn't sharp, throw it out. Yep. You know, then all of a sudden a guy, great photographer, a guy named Nick Nichols, mm -hmm. National Geographic photographer, okay. started doing this motion stuff. And there was a shot of a forest elephant that he took probably a rear sync flash shot where the motion of the elephant's going and you see the motion of the elephant's blurred and just the two eyes are reflecting the light. But it's a blurry shot that 40 years ago, most people look at it and go, oh, trash. Right. All of a sudden it's on the cover now of National Geographic yeah. and everyone's going, oh my God. That's the way we have to shoot. We have to shoot showing the motion. You know, <laughs> Franz Lanting did the same thing. You know, he did a book just on motion, which 50 years ago, why did they, why did they publish this book of a bunch of blurry shots? Yeah. Okay. But it's all interpretation. And, and it's trendy. Photography is trendy. It's very trendy. People are saying, okay, what can we do that hasn't been done before? Mm -hmm. Because that's, I guess, the big objective. So I started teaching myself so I could provide images for my papers to get them published. Okay. And then what I started doing is I started saying, well, let me start submitting these things to contests. Mm -hmm. And I started winning some of these contests. I started winning, you know, the pop photography, Shutterbug, they started getting published. I thought, this is great, you know, fantastic. And then I entered the International Nikon Contest. It's one of the largest contests. And this is not the national one. This is the one that comes out of Tokyo. Wow. Yeah, Nikon's contest, and I won it. Oh, my God. And, um, when was that? Oh, gosh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Wow. And it was like a $10,000 prize, $10,000 worth of Nikon equipment. Oh, my god. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I got a call from the folks at Nikon in New York, Nikon USA in New York, and they said, you know, we'd like to see more of your images. Well, wait, this is funny because they said, can you send us your portfolio? I had no idea what a portfolio <laughs> was. Thought, a portfolio, what are you talking about? Is that a book or something? I don't have any books. I said, no, no, just a collection of your images. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I put some images together and I got to meet some of the, the, the uh, management people up there and I sat down with them and we talked and they said, you know, we really like your images. But the other thing I think that was important was they liked, I think, my passion for photography. Yeah. You know, you've got to be passionate about it. At the end of the day, I think there's really two major categories of photographers. And they overlap in many ways. Uh -huh. But generally speaking, there are the artists. Uh -huh. You know, the people who take one shot to frame and artistically expressive on the wall. And then they're the storytellers. Uh -huh. I'm a storyteller. Okay. okay. And I use images to tell a story. You can tell a story sometimes with one image, or sometimes you can do a whole just you know, collage of images. But I use those images to tell a story. And, and I, that's how I think when I photograph things. I think, how am I going to tell this story? Tell what happens here. Uh, again, I'm not that guy who's going to go out and, you know, I look at some of the professional photographers that I've been privileged to work with. You know, guys like Joe McNally. This guy's a legend. I've idolized him since I was a young kid. Yeah. But Joe, the difference between somebody like Joe and me is that Joe creates an image. Uh -huh. Joe paints with light. Joe can take this empty room start putting his speed lights everywhere, uh -huh. and he creates a new world. Right. I couldn't do that if my life depended on it. Okay? <laughs> That's a true, that to me is a true photographer, the true legendary photographer. Okay. Somebody who envisions painting with light with their speed lights makes something out of nothing. What I do, on the other hand, is I just capture a moment. Okay. I'm out in the wild, animals, you know, I don't have the luxury of saying, oh, excuse me, can you turn a little bit to the right? Oh, wait a minute, the sun's in the wrong place. Can we move over here? I got to work around that. And I have to be able to capture a moment. So basically what I'm doing is I'm being in the right place at the right time. Okay. And what I tell people all the time, especially with wildlife photography, the success in wildlife photography 
There's three major points to it. All right. Number one is you need to know your subject. Okay. Just like you know your model or working with your model, knowing your subject. And as a zoologist, as a naturalist, I can anticipate behaviors. I study animals. I watch them for a long time. So when you anticipate a behavior, you're prepared to catch the moment. Now, I have a question about that because we have a lot of people. In fact, I would say most of our viewers and listeners probably either have been to Africa or want to go to Africa. So would it be a good idea for them to study the behavior beha ahead of time or do they, are you just like stuck on a safari where they're going to take you here, take a picture, hey, you know what I mean? No, no. You need to study the behavior of these so animals. You know, because first of all, when you go on safari, your driver is listening to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's not a cheap trip. <laughs> no. So when you go on safari, you have a driver and you say, listen, I want you to stay here, wait here. If you see two male giraffe that are starting to look at each other like they're standing off and everybody else in the car goes click click okay got it let's go to the next thing because everybody always thinks they're missing something somewhere else okay? Oh, okay and that's the biggest mistake you can make i just got back from my 51st trip to africa five one five one and it oh never gets goodness. old and i can't tell you how many times i've gone out and people have asked me to lead them on these trips to africa and we've gone out and i've been with them in the vehicle and we're in the middle of a herd of 200 elephants 200 elephants and these people go and they go okay choo -choo, choo -choo, choo -choo. they take like 10 20 shots and go okay got it where do we go now ah. i go are you out of your mind <laughs> look what's happening here around you all these behaviors are changing all the time the light is changing all the time everybody's in a rush to get to something they think they're missing ah. and what you have to understand is you have to wait i can wait at a water hole for 10 hours without a single animal come by and i'm i'm happy wow. i'm happy just being out there so you have to understand your models okay. to know a behavior okay. to know when you look at a giraffe standing at each other oh they got the perfect shot because they're looking at each other oh but wait a minute i know because they're looking at that they're going to challenge each other here in a few minutes oh, and they're going to start next sparring they're going to start doing it. just oh. wait and see you see a male lion sleeping with a female lion and they're by themselves in the middle of the serengeti and they're sleeping but oh they're sleeping let's go no no because that male lion is with that female lion because she's an estrus you will never see a male with a female by themselves i call it the honeymoon couple unless it's the dominant male that has followed the cycling female and they're sleeping but they're only going to sleep for 15 to 20 minutes because every 20 minutes she's going to get up and want to be bred okay uh, so they may look like they're out like a light sit there for 20 minutes i promise you i can't tell you how many people i've taken on safari that is oh come on they're just sleeping they're not doing anything the lions just sleep like, just wait oh just gosh. and then all of a sudden the tail goes, she gets up and then, and then you get this incredible action because lion breeding can be very demonstrative uh -huh. and you get the roaring and you get all kinds of stuff and people oh my god thank you so much we would have missed it you know <laughs> That's, you have to have that patience. You have to understand what these animals are going to do. So understanding the model, number one, Okay. patience. That's I funny. cannot tell you it is the single most important thing in wildlife photography is patience, waiting. And the other thing, and a lot of people will tell you, well, that really, really people don't like to use it, luck. Luck, yeah. is a tremendous amount of luck. And any great wildlife photographer who tells you that there is not a tremendous, I make my own luck. They're lying to you. Yeah, because okay? you can't control that you, you, lion you, you, or can, you can't or control bear. anything. You can try to anticipate. You can try to prepare. Yeah. But at the end of the day, luck has a lot to do with it. So those three things are very important. And that's what makes wildlife photography so different than studio photography right. in a lot of ways. Or landscape photography. Exactly. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't really need a lot of camera knowledge photographic knowledge for wildlife photography. You need to understand the moment underst you need to understand and understand the, the basics. Wildlife. But these studio photographers, these people are the those are the people who do incredible to me i mean when i see these folks take a room and all of a sudden put these and all of a sudden they transform it when i look at the image i go holy geez how did you see that yeah so i think their brains are wired in a different way so i carry a bit of a chip on my shoulder being called a nikon ambassador because it's the company i grew up with i mean ever since i heard paul simon sing about it and you know oh, yeah, ectochrome oh um, <laughs> i said i wanted to have a nikon camera to think that this incredible company would have me as one of their I was so part of the was founding class. The contest that it was from the contest and then an interview. And then because what happens is... So then you sent them your portfolio. I sent, I sent them pictures and we had an and interview. And you had the interview. And I think that's what an important part is, is the interview. Okay. Because I'm sure, Peggy, you've interviewed a lot of people. And um, there are people who are really great photographers, fantastic photographers. They're not necessarily great communicators. Um, I've gone to some of these, you know, Photo Plus conventions, uh, you know, the CES, yeah. all these big photo conventions, and I, I've seen this guy's work. I go, I gotta go watch this guy because his work is fantastic. Gets up on the stage, and he goes, and here I was on the beach, and, uh, and I took this picture. And, uh, I'm like, crap, that image is incredible. What did you do? I was just next slide. 
Uh, this is up in the Rocky Mountains. I, mean, I was like, oh, oh. My God, you're killing me. And that's the problem, is that some, there are some photographers that are great photographers, but they become invisible behind their camera. Right. I think what Nikon was looking for were people who could create impactful images, but also tell the story of how they got those right. images with some passion. And, and I love that. I mean, I'm, you've got passion. Well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just so lucky, you know. You, yeah. you get to do this stuff. You get to be out in the wild. A little kid from refugees in a New York City apartment. Who would have thought I would have been gone to Africa 51 times? You know. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've awesome. tracked. I've tracked tigers on elephant back in India. I've gone swimming with sea lions in the Galapagos. Wow. I've had a polar bear up in front of my nose in a cage in the Arctic. These are things that. My favorite saying in the world is this: Life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take. It's measured by the number of times your breath is taken away. Oh, I love that. And that's I can so tell good. you that I've had those moments with my camera, with animals. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of photography, especially in wildlife photography. Because generally speaking, that split second when you hit that shutter, that moment is never going to happen exactly that way again. Yeah, that's for sure. And again, I've told you, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But a gift that's been given to me, I don't know, God, my parents, however you want to call it, is that I, you can show me any image I've taken over the last 25 years. And I remember taking it. I can tell you where it was. Wow. I can almost tell you what it smelled like when I took that image. Oh my God. That's the kind of indelible impression photography makes with me. And again, I couldn't, my, my, if you look at my chemistry grades in college, you'd think I was the dumbest dump in the world. <laughs> so this is the beauty of photography for me, and especially wildlife photography. It gets me outside, it gets me to appreciate nature, and it gives me the greatest tool I have to communicate that, especially to students and youngsters. That's awesome. So what, what does a Nikon ambassador do? What well, does that mean? I do presentations around the country for Nikon on wildlife, on how to shoot with your camera, how to take pictures of wildlife. Um, you know, a lot of the photo shows, we do our, our presentations. Uh, basically, what, what we are is we're, I was part of the, the uh, initial inaugural group of ambassadors, oh, which is okay. an incredible privilege. Oh, but the wow. way I, I never felt like I belonged there because I was with people like Joe McNally, yeah, you yeah. know, Bill Frakes. These are incredible photographers. Um, uh, Joel Sartori, I mean, this guy's in National Geographic. He's a god, you know. Oh, he was uh, here last time. Yeah, Joel, Joel's a great yeah. guy, you know, and, and, and I'm thinking, I don't belong in this list. But the way, I, the way I kind of use the analogy is, you might not be a sports person, but when they had the original dream team, when the Olympics finally said, well, you can take the professional players from the NBA and put them on the USA team. Mm -hmm. That initial dream team, was, you know, Magic Johnson, Michael Jordan, Larry Bird. I mean, it was incredible people, the greatest team ever, in my opinion. Uh -huh. So they had all these guys, and then they had a guy named Christian Leitner. He was the guy from Duke University. Okay. He was the amateur on the team. Okay. okay? Well, I'm the Christian Leitner of the Nikon <laughs> Ambassador. Group. That's me. Okay? And, and I'm there, I hope, to just inspire, because sometimes it could be intimidating. You know, if you look at somebody like a Franz Lanting, like a Joel Sartori, you get up there and you think, I'm never going to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I really got to throw credit. If you ever get a chance to talk to, to, to Joe McNally, he really is probably my photographic hero. Because the first time I watched him speak, now this is a guy I'd idolized. Uh -huh. I'd watched him. I'd seen his body. I mean, this guy is unbelievable. Right. Uh, yeah. First time I saw him speak, he got up on stage and he put up a bunch of images that, quite frankly, were not that good. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, some of them were pretty bad. And I'm like, wow, what's happening here? Joe's like... And he'd smile, he goes, what do you think of those images? And nobody wanted to say anything. You know, uh. some people would go kind of courteously, oh, yeah, okay. uh. and Joe would go, they stink. Uh. And I took all of them. You have to go through this. Understand that every image I'm showing you up here of my great stuff, there's a hundred of them that were trash. Okay? That's how we learn. And, and, and these images are not just images I took when I was 19 or 20. I've taken images like this when I'm in my 40s and 50s. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's part of photography. Don't get intimidated by these images that people look at and say, oh my gosh, I'm never going to be able to do that. Yeah. That's not our job as ambassadors. Our job as ambassadors is to encourage you to put a camera in your hand, go out and start taking pictures. Yeah. So that's, that's what we do. It's funny because I have a, a very similar story when I first got and started my own company. I went to a week-long workshop with this famous wedding photography, mm -hmm. Bambi Cantrell, which... Yeah, Bambi's also an ambassador. I was going to say. Yeah, she's Bambi an is. Yes. Anyway, I was, like, totally intimidated. Everybody there, I was sure, was a million times better photographer. And I actually took two classes from her. But the she had flown in from California, and she had done a wedding, like, the day before or something. So she just threw all those images up on the screen to show us how she like went through them because digital photography was really new back then. Right. 
and there were so many bad shots. And it was the most encouraging thing that ever happened to me as a photographer to think somebody like her could take all those bad shots. And, th and that's what makes her and people like Joe great ambassadors because they show people, listen, everybody takes bad images, okay? It's just being able to pursue having the patience to come up with those images. You know, sometimes it's, it's one image that'll just, like break the doors open for you. It happened for me in kind of a, a unique way in a lot of ways. Hurricane Andrew. Uh -huh. uh, and this is, you know, I always carry a point and shoot like on my hip, just a little cool pics. And um, one of the things we had to do for Hurricane Andrew to protect animals was we caught all the flamingos up. Okay. And we took all the flamingos, and to protect them, we put them in the public restrooms in the zoo. Oh, okay. So I remember taking all these flamingos and throwing them in the bathroom, and I look back and said, look at all these flamingos standing next to the urinals and the sinks. It just didn't look, it was a weird picture. I just took a picture. Took this picture from me. I was like, whatever the heck. Okay. Went on. Of course, Hurricane Andrew came, destroyed the zoo. It was a catastrophic storm. At the time, it was the storm of a lifetime. Yeah, I remember. And then all of a sudden, everybody was getting pictures of boats on top of people's houses, cars turned over, roofs taken off, all that. It was becoming, the common denominator was this human disaster. And everybody right. said, so there was a, a friend of mine said, listen, we're looking for some image that is different. Right. I said, you know, I got an image. It's not after the storm, but it's prepare it. And I showed them the image of the flamingos. They go, oh, my God, we love this. Ah. It turned out being featured in Newsweek magazine. And that image has paid thousands and thousands of dollars to me in royalties. Why? Not because it was technically a great image, because technically it was not. I mean, yeah. it was composed okay, but it's a straight flash, blase. It was just, but it's the moment. Right. That's so I try to tell really people unique. that. Yeah. Don't miss the moment. There's a great commercial uh, showing a guy you know, with his tripod and all this stuff, and he's trying to turn up his tripod, and he's doing all this stuff, and, and then all of a sudden this other guy's got a point, and, you go, Shh, and he's got the shot, and as soon as he's got, the, 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 the animal's gone. Yeah. Okay? Uh. Guys, <laughs> understand, you don't want to miss the moment. Get the moment, if you have the luxury of time, that you can then start fine-tuning your settings, put it on the sticks, or whatever you're gonna do, then do it. But at the end of the day, especially today, unfortunately, because the, the bar has been set kind of low, uh -huh. on what people take for photographs now. You know, photojournalism especially. People are taking stuff with their iPhones and stuff like that. Yeah. The quality of the photograph, get the moment. Yeah. Get the moment. Don't get so caught up that it's the rule of thirds, it's tack sharp in the corner. Don't get all caught up in that. I tell people, if you look at an image and you smile right away, it's a good image. Yeah. Okay? Can we make it a great image? Yeah. How do we do that to make it a great image? But the minute you look at an image and you, oh, and, th and if you look at it long enough, you can start finding all kinds of flaws of in the photographic world. But what is, what is the reason we take photographs? Yeah. Is the reason to impress our photographer peers that we were sharp in the edges and perfect thirds and perfect light? Yeah, uh, or is the reason to make the majority of people smile or have some kind of emotional impact? That's what the reason I for photography is. Yeah. And, and sometimes, I think, you know what I say, it's, it's okay just to do, just to do, like, I want to remember this moment. I don't need a beautiful picture. Absolutely. I just don't want to forget this. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, Grab your cell phone and grab that picture so it's that's just it. part of your memory. It doesn't have to be a beautiful... And, and, and to Nikon's credit, that's what they made very clear to us as ambassadors. Listen, we're not out there to make people be in awe of your pictures. That's you're right. out there to inspire people to take the same kind of pictures. That's what you're out there for. So now you go around speaking, yes. mostly, for that, for I do, Nikon. I do speak for Nikon. I, I help them with some you know, introduction of new product every now and then, wildlife products. I've, I've used things for them. And, and you're testing a lens for them? I'm testing a lens coming up. So yeah, there's going to be a new that's lens. That's kind of fun, isn't that's it? Pretty so you nice. get like, you stuff get the, early? You get the stuff early. Yeah, Ooh, it's kind of cool. nice. That yeah. would be fun, I think. Yeah, it is, it is very fun. It really wow. is. That really is, is so cool. It's Christmas year round with Nikon. And you've been an ambassador for 20 years? No, the ambassador program started five years ago? Six oh, years five ago. Years yeah, ago. five or six years ago it started. I was oh, part of the inaugural gosh. class, which is what I was like, holy jeez, are you kidding me? Okay. You know. Okay. Now, you've done some documentaries, too. That's true. No, I, I, I is have. That, is that more photography related or that's well, I, more I, zoology related? It's more related. zoology related, okay. but I have used my photography. Like, you know, I won an Emmy for photography for a documentary I did with alligators that I shot totally with my Nikon D5. No kidding. And it, was, and it was all video. I shot video with that. And I won an Emmy Award for it. And it was all yeah. shot with a DSLR. So, I mean. Now, um, where can we find your documentaries? Jeez, I don't know. Uh, they, they are done uh, from the ABC affiliates in Miami, the NBC affiliate in Miami, and the CBS affiliate in Miami. They've, they've put them out. I don't know if they're on YouTube or whatever. Basically, I've done documentaries in Africa, the Galapagos, Machu Picchu, Alaska. Um, now we're going to be, I leave for Antarctica in January to do oh, one. I so, now, what's the Antarctica trip about? Well, I, I have a program that I started. Um, I look back at my life. You know, 
again, having been very fortunate to travel to these incredibly exotic places, and I'll come back and I'll present at schools, and I'd show the photographs and I'd show the images, and these kids, they remind me of me. When I sat as a student and I looked at things like Wild Kingdom where their eyes turned into saucers, you know, and I think, oh my gosh, what a dream it would be to see something like that. And I've always said to myself, you know, if I could take every kid for five minutes uh -huh. and put them in some of these places that I've been able to, to see, right. just for five minutes, we wouldn't have any worries about saving the environment or protecting nature because these kids would just be so inspired. Of course, that's not realistic. Can't do that. Yeah. But what if I took one kid and I did a documentary with that one kid and then that one kid becomes an ambassador for the wild. Okay. So I came up with a program. I call it the Eco Hero program. And I do it every Hero. Eco Hero. I do okay. it every year in South Florida. Uh -huh. And basically, any high school student who has done something positive for the environment can be nominated for this, this award. Oh. And these kids do everything from beach cleanups, starting recycling programs. I had a kid who did a whole water, water filtration outfit for Haiti, you know, after the earthquake. Oh I mean, God. incredible things. Um, and the winner goes on this trip with me <gasps> and is accompanied by the ABC News affiliate, and we do a documentary on it, and we do the documentary through their eyes. Wow. So right now, the, this trip this year is Antarctica, and it's going to be very timely. I mean, there's all kinds of, you know, concerns with climate change and how Antarctica actually has a direct uh, impact on South Florida with the sea level rise and things like that. So these are the things that I do. We have this contest. I get them sponsored, and all expenses paid. The kid goes with a parent or guardian of his or her choice. And like I said, I've brought kids all over the world doing these documentaries that have oh. won a lot of awards. Oh, my God. That and it inspires so them. You know, we put a cool. camera in their hands. We tell them, take pictures. Remember this. Remember this. That's, you know, I'm not the, the, the great family photographer. I couldn't, you know, God bless you for wedding photography and things like that, because I could never do that. I mean, I just, but. It's much easier to have an, a lion attack I get, you. Well, <laughs> no, it's not bad. It's just, you know, I, but, but, but one of the things, when I do take photographs during family events and stuff, you know, everybody's always like, okay, let's go. You know, everybody's complaining about having to take photographs. But who's the first one calling you two or three days later? Where are the pictures? You want to post the pictures? Let me see the pictures, okay? <laughs> And those pictures, as every day goes by, those pictures become more and more valuable. Yeah. And I've realized that more and more in time. I, pictures that you know, were kind of a pain in the butt, butt to take years ago, I cherish those pictures now because a lot of times the pic people in those pictures are no longer with us. These moments that never happen that way again, that is the beauty of photography. And, and more so than video. I, I know I'm probably old school that way, but especially in wildlife photography. Because in wildlife photography, the camera will see things that you won't see with your eye. A split second, an emotion, a moment in an animal. If you can that freeze it. If you can freeze it. Yeah. And that's what makes it. Yeah. I've taken video of things that I've also taken still photographs of, and I'll look at the video looking for the moment I've captured in the still, and I can't see it. Yeah. It happens that quickly. It goes too fast. So that's I, the beauty of still exactly photography. Being able to freeze about. that moment, that's what I like. Yeah, that is so, so cool, so true. So now, okay, so you've got this eco, what's Hero. it called? Eco Hero, Hero, Hero program. Contest, yeah. And... So you, you're working at the zoo. Yeah. You have day-to-day -day activities there. I do. Duties. You're doing all these extra programs. Mm -hmm. You're on a weekly radio show? I'm on a weekly radio show. <laughs> and that's, you know, I probably get more attention for this radio show. I do a lot of radio. I do a lot of television. I'm, I'm one of the wildlife experts for Good Morning America, for MSNBC, for CNN, and for the Spanish networks also, because I speak Spanish also. So uh, yeah, I do a lot of... lucky your parents spoke Spanish That's true. That was the first language because they taught me. Because our generation... If the immigrants didn't speak their language mm. to the kids, they told them, oh, don't do that. Yeah. You know, they need to, so you it got was, lucky. That you're I got very lucky, and it helped me. And I, I didn't like it in the beginning, because when I went to New York, you know, when I was going to school in New York, and I just spoke Spanish, I got ostracized. Yeah. I was made fun of. I was bullied quite a bit. And fortunately, down in Miami, that's not much of an issue. Yeah, but yeah. but it, I'm so glad I know the language, yeah. because it opened so many more doors for me. Okay, but so in addition ahead. to those television shows, I do a weekly radio show on ESPN. Okay. It's called The Dan Lebertard Show, and it's a national show. Wow. Every Tuesday I go on for 10 minutes and I answer questions about wildlife. Sometimes it's a lot of tongue-in-cheek stuff. We have a lot of fun with it. Okay. Uh, you know, people will ask me questions like, okay, okay, well, like who would win between one polar bear and the offensive line of the Miami Dolphins ah. yeah, in a fight? <laughs> I get a lot of those questions. Oh, who would win between a gorilla and a lion, you know, if they fought? Oh. And I give them the answer and I tell them why the answer, you know, what animal has what benefits that would lead me to believe that this animal would win. But in that tongue-in-cheek way that we're giving these types of facts and doing kind of stupid macho stuff, uh -huh. I'm trying to give them information. They're, lear they're, they're learning. learning. They're learning yeah. about animals and yeah. they're showing an interest. And it's one of the most popular segments on ESPN. When I first started doing it, the suits at ESPN up in Connecticut said, 
they told Dan Levitard, why are you having this guy on your show? He's an animal guy. This is ESPN he, is sports, sports Network. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and Dan is a good friend. He's one of the greatest writers and columnists and, and radio personalities I know. Uh, and he said, listen, I want the guy on my show. Wow. And sure enough, it became one of their, I started that show se six, seven years ago now. And every I've been doing week? it every, every week on Tuesday. Wow. 10 or 15 minutes, that's all it is. And um, now ESPN calls me and I actually do Sports Center. I'll go on Sports Center on their video part to talk about animal mascots. Okay, you know, if the Eagles were playing the Rams and an Eagle fought a Ram, who would win? You know. Ah! So Dan, Dan laughs, chuckles now because Dan says, you know, these guys who didn't watch on the show first, now they're using you on their main show. So it's a lot of fun. You know? But one of the things, what's really important, Peggy, is that people have to understand you can't take yourself too seriously in life. You know, and I learned that from a lot of the, 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 the television people that I've worked with over the years because I was very you know, uptight. You know, I was like, oh, listen, I'm not going to do anything tongue-in-cheek. This is animal and wildlife. This is all serious stuff. Life is too short to do that. Yeah. You want to engage a greater audience, have fun, learn to laugh at yourself, and people will get on your team. That's awesome. You have a fabulous personality. I, so did I, you just lucky. start, though, like with little local things in Miami? I mean, there are a lot of, like, you know, we think of Jack Hanna. Of course, I think of Jack sure. Hanna. As the Jack's thing. a good friend. I've done the shows with Jack many times. But, I mean, there, there are probably a lot of zoo people who would mm -hmm. love to be the spokesperson for their, you know, on Good Morning America. So how, how I was just, does that career path happen for I was you? just very lucky. Did I you mean, start with small local shows? Yeah, I was doing small local shows. And what happened was hearing of you Miami's a springboard for great journalistic talent across the nation. Yeah, Miami's a big city. You know, That's people like nice. Katie Couric. I mean, uh, uh, you know, um, God, who was the old guy? I forget his name. Larry King. Those oh, yeah. people all started in Miami. Oh, I didn't know You know, that. Lonnie Quinn, who's the big weather person for CBS in New York now, does a national CBS show, was in Miami. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So what happens is <laughs> I did a lot of the local stick with them. And when they moved on to the big networks, they would tell the network, hey, you got to have this guy McGill up here. Fly him up, you know, and they'd fly me up and the thing would work out and all of a sudden I'm their guy. Now you're all over the place. And, it, 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 it's just, and I think it's because I try not to speak too technically about things. Yeah. I think a lot of people sometimes, especially scientists, you know, they, mm -hmm. I don't know whether they're just more concerned with impressing their peers as opposed to impacting the general public. Uh, people need to understand who their audience is. Yeah. And if we can, there's very simple ways to say complicated things. That's the bottom line. But oh, if you want to go I'm out. I'm stealing that. Oh, the, the, that down the, the, it, it's, it's true, <laughs> you know. These guys go out there with all these big SAT words and they think they're impressing people because they're using all these big fancy words. It's not necessary. You're ostracizing. You're, al you're alienating a bunch of people that way. Keep it simple. Keep it simple, and what I tell people all the time, especially when I'm speaking, like, you know, I speak at these, these photo conferences and conventions and such, I tell them, the first thing I tell them is, that you guys out there probably know a lot more about cameras and photography than I do, yeah. as far as the technical, uh -huh. you know. I remember when I first started, these guys, these, you know, these guys would go out there, oh yeah, this is uh, F-250 at, at uh, F-4, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, they could look at the thing and they had a meter in their head. They knew what it was. I can do that now. I can't. I couldn't See, do it back then. But I can't do that. So I'm thinking to myself, why am I speaking to these people? Because they know a whole lot more. And then I realized because I'm here to show them that because I don't know what they know, but look what I'm able to accomplish, think of what they could accomplish if they just set their mind to it. Yeah. That's all it is. You know, our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. And you heard my little commercial in the beginning. It took me three years to learn to shoot a manual, and it's not even that hard. <laughs> but I had all those teachers yeah. that were well, so technical that I didn't know what they were talking about. But in all fairness to you, it was a lot harder back in film days. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it took uh, a lot longer. That whole thing, I mean. My poor son, he used to have to stand there with a whiteboard. F8, 125. Oh. I took a couple pictures. F9. Well, just, yeah, the whole, the whole film couple. thing was also a nightmare just for wildlife <laughs> photography. You know, think about it. Your film roll max was 36 images. Oh. Peggy, I shoot 36 frames in two seconds now. Now, yeah. Two seconds, I can yeah. shoot 36 frames. And I'm thinking, what, are you out of your mind? And not only that, one of my first trips to, to see the mountain gorillas in Rwanda, you're traveling to the other side of the world. I'm hiking up a freaking mountain for eight hours, finally get to the gorillas, I'm shooting. Da, 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 da. Oh my God. Oh, you're, da, da, da. Mm. And you're already challenged basically because it's a black animal in a dark forest. You're not allowed to use any flash. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Oh, please come out. Come on. I go, and I'm, God, this film's lasting a long time. And oh, I'm, crap. I'm looking, I'm going, I'm like, I'm on number 50. How can that be? It's a film. I never caught the thing on the prongs, you know, and I'm advancing. I'm thinking, oh my God, are you serious? Do you know how many times I've gotten rolls back and it's just a strip of nothing? I've been there. Oh no, it's terrific. 
It's horrific. Know. People I talk know. to you, oh, yeah, but you know, your card goes corrupt and you lose everything. That's minimal compared to what you're dealing <laughs> what with with film. To to, you know, know, having to change film in the snow, in the ice, or in the humidity, and you're opening the, 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 the back of the camera and all the bugs are flying in. It was a nightmare. Okay? This is like, you guys today have no idea how lucky you are with digital <laughs> photography. You put in a freaking XQD card, you can shoot a thousand frames on that thing. And, you know, it's nothing. Yeah. And you got your teacher right there in the LCD. I can't believe everybody doesn't have a camera out there shooting. It's the greatest hobby on the face of the planet. I agree with that. <laughs> you brought something up. Now, I saw you speak, I don't even know, like probably five years ago. Maybe even more. I don't know. I'm old. It could have been a long time ago. I'm yeah. old, too. Not really old as I <laughs> Anyway, it was uh, at the Florida Professional Photographers Convention in Orlando, and I had gone every year. For, and I was a little bored with the speakers, and I was like, oh, there's a nature guy. Oh, that's because it's mostly <laughs> wedding and portrait right, photographers, right. right? I'm like, nature guy, because by then I had been teaching a couple years here, and I was noticing that my clientele were, were turning, you know, I thought I was going to be teaching all these portrait photographers, but the people who were coming for classes were nature Outdoor. photographers. Sure. So I was really interested. So I went, and you were amazing, amazing speaker. You're so passionate and funny. <laughs> But one of the things you said that really, I just was like, I like this guy, is you're like, don't be afraid of flash. Absolutely. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes that nature photographers make. They go outside, it's a sunny day. I don't need a speed light. I'm going to go out there. So why do you need a flash? My gosh, filling in shadows. You know, you look at a sunny day, people, oh, it's a sunny day. I want to go out and shoot. Now it's going to be great. No, sunny days make hard shadows. You need to try to balance those shadows. It's not, listen, we're not shooting anymore with the little, cubes that just go poof, you know. <laughs> these, these, these speed lights, they cost a lot of money for a reason, because you can paint with them. Yeah. I mean, that's what photography means. I think it's a great term, painting with light, yeah. okay? You can take these speed lights and you can dial them up or dial them down. You got that LCD. If you look at something, if I'm photographing an orangutan, okay, orangutan has very big brows. If I take a picture of an orangutan on a sunny day and I don't use a, a speed light, it's black holes. It's just black holes. Okay, so not even there, okay? Birds especially, birds with feathers. You have to understand, Many of the colors you see, and this is where my zoology pays off, okay? okay? Where the colors you see in bird feathers, they're not pigments. It's refracted light. Ah. For instance, blue pigment does not exist in birds. If you see blue in a bird, it's not pigment. Okay. It's refracted light. Really? See, yes. I didn't know that. So I by using something. a speed light, <laughs> you enhance that refracted light and you enhance the color of the bird. Plus, I just find it, I love to get that little catch light in the eye. Yeah, I do a speed too. light, you get that little catch light in the eye. It just gives a vibrance. It gives a vitality to the image. Um, I, I show when I do my presentations, I show the difference. I say, okay, here's a shot I took without the speed light. And everybody goes, oh, it's a nice shot. The speed light, oh, yeah. colors of mirrors. You know, there's a way to do it where you don't get the hard shadows. Okay. Uh, it's just a matter of just filling in light. And people think, oh, it's sunny. My, my, my speed light's not going to reach all the way over there. I'm shooting an animal that's 25, 30 feet away. Wrong! You will be amazed. And I didn't believe it myself until I did the tests. Mm -hmm. I sat there, I'm going, because your eye doesn't see it, because it's a sunny day, you don't realize it. Yeah. But it is picking that up. It is making a subtle difference. It makes a huge difference in those types of things. What about that, like the better beamer or the mag thing? Those things help. They, de they definitely help enhance the light in certain areas. I just, I, I, I try to carry as little gear as I can. Oh, man, we have that in yeah, common, that's, too. See, that's, that's, <laughs> that's another thing that some of the nature guys get a little upset with me on, because I rarely have ever used sticks. Ah. I, you know, but I'm fortunate. I'm a pretty big guy. I'm six foot six, you know, so the lenses, my elbow goes in here. I don't have to be strong. I literally have like a little tripod right here on my yeah. arm. I just sit. But with wildlife, I got to be able, you know, I got to be able to do this. I if know. I'm digitally with that thing, it's different if you're doing landscape photography or if you have the luxury where an animal is being still and you can do a portrait. But the majority of my photography is behaviors, action, moving right. back and forth. So, so I need to be able to, gonna slow you it's going to slow me down. It's going to slow me down. And Yes, are some of my images soft? Absolutely. Some of them are flat out horribly blurry, okay? But every now and then you get that one image. And, and uh, another thing, Peggy, I can't tell you how many great images I've gotten by accident. Yeah. Totally by accident. <laughs> I go up and people go, oh, that's a great image. How'd you get it? I go, I got lucky. I'd like to say I knew exactly what I was doing. I got lucky. Oh, geez. Okay. And that's just it. I mean, you got to make photography real for people. Yeah. Uh, I think that's very, very important. So, all right, so what are some tips for, if, if I'm going to go, because Zoo Miami is an, mm. is an amazing zoo. It is. It's a great there photography zoo. There are no cages. Zoo. Right. It's great zoo the photography. animals are out. So if I want to go on a little field trip, let's say, it's mm -hmm. only two hours away. Right. 
What are some tips for photographing captive animals? And then what's the difference between photographing a captive animal and an animal like in Africa in the wild? Well, the biggest difference, of course, is you're not chasing it. Yeah, because okay. it can't go and, too far. And that's, that's <laughs> another thing I try to tell people is very important. You should never chase animals ever okay. in the wild. You know, uh, I always tell people if you find a good place and you stay put, you'd be surprised what comes to you. And that's when you're going to get the best images because you're not getting an animal that is reacting to you chasing it. You're getting an animal that's acting normally because you were there when it got there. Okay. So I try to tell people the best you can is find yourself a blind by a water hole or some place that might be frequented by animals. The advantage in the zoo, of course, is you have an animal that's in a, a captive situation. Right. The great thing about zoos like Zoo Miami is that you can photograph these animals now without the bars, without the cages, without the, these barriers. Um, but having said that, always be aware of your backgrounds. Mm. And I still do this, Peggy. Mm -hmm. I still, I can't tell you how many times I've taken a picture of a lion with a tree coming out of the back of his head. It looks like he's got antlers, yeah. you know, <laughs> because you get so focused on the animal. Oh my God, the animal. you're just looking at the animal and you forget about that background. So always make sure you're aware of the background. Uh, when you're shooting in a place like a zoo, I try to shoot aperture priority where I keep my aperture wide open okay. so the depth of field is minimal okay. so you can barely make out what the background is. If you can get trees, even if you had a little bit of a fence back there or something, if you, you know, you're shooting up at a 2.8 type aperture, you're going to get kind of a nice modeling, a nice bokeh back there. Okay. And it's going to make a difference in your portrait. You're going to be focused on that thing. You're not going to be distracted with all the stuff behind you. Um, when you do have barriers, uh -huh. a lot of zoos, some, our zoo and some exhibits now have things like mesh or screen. Okay. Try to get as close to that screen as you can. Like put the lens right up If to you it? can get that close, but you don't even have to get that close sometimes. Okay. As long as you can create a distance between the barrier and the animal, okay? Uh -huh. And focus on the animal, aperture priority again, open it wide open. The other you big have to do manual focus on that, right? Yes. You, and sometimes no, sometimes the camera uh, we'll, we'll you know, do we'll do it. We'll get okay. the, the thing you're focusing on. But I always, I tend to go manual focus on those things, um, just so that when I'm moving, it doesn't get caught up in something. I mean, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> this one leopard, this one leopard <laughs> sequence comes to mind right away. I was photographing, it's going to kill, and like one of the key shots, the leopard is blurred, and this one blade of grass, oh, like a f two feet in front of it, is perfectly in sharp. And I'm going, are you oh. kidding me? That the camera actually caught that blade of grass? So yes, that becomes a bit of a challenge. But having said that, if you can create separation between uh -huh. the barrier and the animal, even if it's a fence, a chain link fence, a thick chain link fence, wide open aperture, focus on the animal, you will rack focus that thing right out. It'll just it'll, 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 it'll be you gone. You won't see it. it. Yeah. You will not see it. Okay. So don't let that be a distraction in some of these zoo shots. The other thing is with glass enclosures. Mm. You deal with reflections a lot. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people get in front of a, an aquarium at the reptiles. You know, they're trying to take a shot of the yeah. cobra. And they take a shot with a flash right in front. Oh, and they look at it like, oh, that's terrible. I go, oh, listen, <laughs> it's just the law of physics. Yeah. Light bounces. You know, you remember the old game of Pong? Yeah. I try to tell people that's how light works, too. Think of light as being the ping pong ball. Okay. If you go straight ahead, it comes straight right back at you. But if you come from the side, the ball goes off to the side, the same way with the light. Mm -hmm. So take your camera. If you can take your flash off your camera, just go off to the side, you can shoot right through glass and you'll never see it. And you'll still get a great side, which I like the side lighting more anyway. It gives a little bit more of a profile, a little more detail. I don't like that head-on light as much. Again, it's subjective. But if you can take your flash, or just go off to the side and shoot the animal from the side, that light will bounce off the glass and you'll never see it. Yeah. You know, so don't let those things distract you that way. Okay. The most important thing, be there when the zoo opens. Oh, what time okay. does the zoo open? Our zoo opens at 10 o'clock. Okay. Okay. Um, you're going to get the best light uh -huh. possible, even though ideally it's really you want to be there at 8 o'clock to get but the really good open. light. But they're not open at 8. <laughs> but get there. Now, you're not only going to get the best light, you're going to get the most activity. Okay. Because animals come out, when they first come out to their exhibits in the morning, they're scenting everything, they're kind of exploring everything. Mm -hmm. By midday, they're, they're out. They're all laying around. They're out. Yeah. Then late in the afternoon is another time. Okay. Time I, the, zoo, the zoo closes at 5.30. Okay. The last person's able to get in at 4 o'clock. Okay. But I would get in like 3, 3.30, get yourself set up in there because animals become active. The light is also better then, especially this time of year. We've got yeah, it gets dark at this dark, to Exactly. Right now. You get this great light. Animals are more active. It's cooler. The middle of the day, listen, even when you go to Africa, I've been there so many times. 51. 51 times. <laughs> when, when you go to Africa, you know, your day is basically going on a game drive. Well, you wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, you're out in the game drive until 10 o'clock in the morning. You come back from 10 to 3, you do nothing. 
sleep. You sleep, you eat lunch, you set up by the pool, you, whatever you do. Uh -huh. Okay. Three o'clock, you're back in the vehicle until 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Okay. Okay, because that's the activity time for animals. Okay. It also happens to be the best light. I was going to say, yeah. It's the best light. And now, you know, that's the other thing. These cameras today, the ISO capabilities that they have, I rarely shoot, when I'm out on the field, I rarely shoot be be below 1,000 ISO. Wow. Why? Because I'm shooting action. I got to get the speed. Yeah. Okay. I'll shoot sometimes on aperture priority. So not only am I getting the depth of field, but I'm getting the fastest shutter speed I can get. So, and I'm shooting at 1,000. That's how I can freeze these frames and get these great things. And I'm telling you what, I've blown some of them up big as, you know, a poster size. Right. That I've shot at 34, 3,200 ISO. And they look like the 400 film of years ago. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible stuff. The cameras are amazing. So for wildlife photography, these cameras today have opened up so many doors. You can go out there. Man, I can take a picture of you in pitch black with your, your, your smartphone in front of you and the light of lighting up your face with the smartphone at 6400 ISO. And you can look and say, what a beautiful shot. Things that you would deem have been impossible years ago. Yeah. So, yeah. my God, photography now is just in a place where the sky's the limit. Yeah, I agree with that. Sky's the limit. And it seems like that's what they, the manufacturers seem to be working on. You know, the two things, it seems like getting them lighter, because we don't want to carry the heavy right. equipment around, and then the ISO capability, so you can take pictures in the dark now. And I, th and I think also <laughs> understanding, listen, I know everybody's into the social media stuff, and everybody's using their phone for a bunch of stuff. Those pictures are never going to print. The way, right. the way your camera pictures are. That's true. Okay. I know everybody says, and, oh, and, it looks oh, amazing. Oh, it looks like, yeah, that's amazing. Why am I going to buy a camera when I have this little iPhone that I can keep in my pocket all the time? That's great to capture money when I do something like that. But if you really want to do something where you can print something and you can look at it in a nice big yeah. format, you need a real camera. You need a real camera. And the camera companies today have made it to a point where they really are affordable. You can get some great gear now. They're a lot less money I mean, than they used to be. We are so lucky Although, compared to the masters of 30, 40, 50 years ago. Think about what these guys had to do, the equipment they had to buy and work with and I mean, carry around oh my god I've had, I've had a couple of old film photographers and they the one guy brought his camera in and set it on the table and it was like this thing weighs a ton and I he lugs it out into guys. the everglades you know i <laughs> idolize those guys those guys are really the true masters you know we're just peons that yeah are, i was intimidated. riding their coattails i was intimidated by that camera ned the joe understood it but it was like whoa that's crazy all right 51 trips to africa what are you what are you doing i don't understand is it all the eco? Uh, no, I, I go there. I'm, I do a lot of conservation work. I work in a conservation program for cheetahs. I've been working a lot of conservation programs there. So you're going over there for many different reasons. Many different reasons, but it's, all, it's always, but it's always professional something. working with conservation work with animals, taking photographs, trying to but do But you're not leading photo tours. You're I don't lead photo tours anymore. Oh, oh, you did, though. I did. Oh. I did. I just don't have a time on my calendar anymore. It doesn't sound like you have any time at all. No, I do, I do, I do. Uh, you, you know, have so much going on. It's just a lot of it. fun. I, I just have a tremendous amount of fun. But my big thing is conservation. You know, when I, worked at, when I started working at the zoo 38 years ago, I didn't want to work for an attraction. Oh, Be honest with you, I wasn't a yeah. huge fan of zoos. I will say something that might seem counter of what I do, mm -hmm. but in a perfect world, we wouldn't need any zoos. Right. Okay. okay, but the bottom line is most people will never get the opportunity to go to Africa like I have to see a lion in the Serengeti, uh, you know, to, to see a, a yeah. polar bear in the Arctic. Zoos provide a window to that world when it's done properly. Okay. A zoo has to make the proper commitment. You cannot just be building small cages, having animals pace back and forth. That's horrific. That's unacceptable. Right. And I got to take that to a step further, which is what I'm going to get to right now with what I've done. I didn't want to work for an attraction. I wanted to work for an organization that was making a difference with conservation in the wild. Okay. And quite frankly, in the beginning, when I started at the zoo, we were doing a lot for education, but we really weren't doing a lot of money into the wild to help conservation efforts in the wild. Okay. So years ago, I started an endowment. Now, I'm not a development person. I, I, I'm not a fundraiser by any stretch of the imagination, you know. But I, I believed in this so much. I said, listen, I want to just, and I got with personal friends and people I would meet. You know, sometimes doing the television thing, you meet people that sometimes have some money. Uh -huh. And I tell them, this is a passion of mine. I want to raise money to have an endowment that's going to allow me to fund conservation programs in perpetuity forever. And to make a long story short, to this date, there's $1.5 million in the Ron McGill Conservation Endowment at the wow. zoo that provides tens of thousands of dollars every year just protect animals in the wild. It goes to people. It's not allowed to be spent. One penny is not being allowed to be spent at the zoo. It has to be spent at conserving animals in the wild, supporting researchers in the wild. That's what I use my photographs for. That's what I try to tell my stories about, to get people to engage. There's an old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught. The best tool I have to teach people about the wonders of nature is photography. Wow. 
Wow. Now, how do we find out? Is that through Zoo Miami? Through Zoo Miami. It's through so the Zoo Miami if Foundation. We, if, if somebody here wants to if donate. If somebody wants to donate, they can certainly go to the ZooMiami.org and, uh, and you know, go to the Zoo Miami Foundation. It's a 501c3. And, um, and the great thing is when you donate money to that endowment, your money never gets spent. It gets into a corpus. The corpus just continues to increase, and it provides dividends, which is what is spent every year. Oh, the dividends. The oh. dividends are spent every year. And that's, I did it that way so that I know that long after I'm dead and gone, long after my kids are dead and my grandkids, that is always going to be there, providing conservation money forever. Gosh, you are a remarkable man. No, I'm just uh, a person who has, carries a huge chip on my shoulder, and I can't justify working at a zoo if a zoo is not going to do something for conservation but in the wild. Now, don't zoos, though, in general, I mean, back, okay, in the olden days, they were in the small cages, blah, 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 the animals, but now, aren't most zoos doing good? Absolutely. They're doing like what they're they can. They're helping they're doing what they can, Peggy. animals now. And but they need to do more. Okay. Okay. Zoos cannot spend $20 million on a new exhibit. Uh -huh. Let's say they're going to open a new exhibit. And that's not Is uncommon. That that's what they cost, cost okay? Oh a big, God, big zoo no exhibit idea. can cost $20 million. Let's say you want to build a new exhibit for the tiger, $20 million exhibit for tigers. Wow. If you're going to spend $20 million to build an exhibit for tigers, you better allocate a certain percentage of that money for conservation for tigers in the wild. Oh, okay. If you're not doing that, you're a hypocrite. Oh. And I have put that task on all zoos, my zoo included, um, that you better start providing conservation dollars, serious conservation dollars, or you do not deserve to exist. Wow. Because there's no reason why we can't do it. If they're saying, oh, no, the budget for the exhibit is this much, okay, well, make the exhibit smaller. If you've raised this much money and that's, you said that's what it's going to take to build this exhibit, make the exhibit smaller, take a chunk of that money, and put it to conservation. The public is not going to stand for that anymore. They're not going to stand for just displaying animals right. and saying, oh, well, we're educating people. I understand the premise behind that. Yeah. But the public needs to put their foot down and say, no, 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 no. It needs to be more. We understand what you're doing and educating. We want to have the zoo. We want to have the animals taken care of properly. But we also want to know that you're taking care of them in the wild. Oh, man, that's awesome. Good for you. So now, since we're nearing the end, do you have any last tips, photography tips for our, our uh, viewers and listeners? Just go out and shoot. Just go out and shoot. That's the best tip I can give And throw, just throw those you. bad ones away. Exactly. <laughs> I tell people the greatest invention ever in today's photography Do is we? the delete button. It's the, greatest it's the greatest invention ever. Delete. No problem. But don't delete in the field. No, I don't agree Don't do with that. that. I see so many Why people jumping in the field because I've looked at things in the field and said, oh, I kind of, and then I put it on the screen and go, oh, this is, I didn't see this. This is great. Things that you don't see on your little three inch LCD and you'll see it on the screen, you know? On the flip side, what happens more often is, oh my God, this is great. And I put it on the computer and go, oh crap, it's all the focus. It's all, all the time, you know, much. this little soft focus stuff. But don't delete in the field. I totally agree with okay. that. Having said that, don't hesitate to delete at home. If you look at something that doesn't inspire you right away, get rid of it. That, because I'm still struggling otherwise that. you're going to build up a library of stuff that you're never going to get to and you're going to become inundated with stuff. You're going to go, oh my God, where do I even begin? And then your hard drive will, drive will crash and you won't have anything. Don't get me started on that. I had a bad experience. I have too. <laughs> so what's next for Ron McGill? In January. Tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow I'm speaking at a... Um, Dippy Sig. Dippy Sig. Digital photography imaging special interest group sunny Camera saunders Club. great guy has invited me out there to speak and, and um, i'm looking in, forward to it in naples here florida. in naples florida tomorrow if you want to if you want to get it's only it's free to dippy sig members but it's only thirty dollars a year to join dippy and that's SIG. a great great group so you're speaking at uh southwestern southwest College florida State. they changed the name it used to be something else southwest florida i don't know the name of the college Florida Southwestern College. Florida Southwestern, that's what it is. Yes, I'm speaking tomorrow, tomorrow, nine o'clock. Naples campus. Nine a.m. to noon. Three hours they're going to have me up there. I'm so excited. Who knows what that's going to be like? I'm excited. But I got a lot of great images. I'm going to tell some great stories with images tomorrow. I, I believe it. All right, what else is coming up for you besides that? Going to Antarctica. Going oh to Antarctica God. in January. And who's the winner? Do we have the winner yet? Uh, that winner will find out on Wednesday. Oh my God! Well, we announced now, the winner on Wednesday. How do we find that endowment? Is that that? Person? That's the same endowment. That endowment is done. Well, that's the, the endowment same thing supports from that. Zoo Miami. Yes, from Zoo Miami, it supports these kids going on these trips to educate them. And con when we go on these trips, we always make a contribution to a conservation program at the location that we're at. So, is it going to be on their website on Wednesday? It will. Well, I'm sure it'll be on their website. Who wins? Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. Local10.com. That's and, our and they're ABC teenage affiliate. kids. Yeah, yeah, high school, high school students. Wow. High school students. What else you got? Anything? 
I said, geez, you know, I'm just going around. I go back to Africa again in August. I'm going to be doing a big thing in Botswana and, uh, and South Africa in August. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to working with some new equipment. Um, you know, I, yeah. listen, every day is an adventure. I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, you know, I've watched, uh, you know, my, my kids grow up and do well. And, uh, you know, I, I, listen, even when bad things have happened to me, Peggy, it's been for a good reason. I'll give you a real quick story, classic example. I got bitten pretty badly by a crocodile. Ooh, a okay. crocodile, not an alligator. No, a crocodile. And I had to go to the was hospital. Was that here in Florida? It was here in Florida. Uh, I was moving a crocodile, and I messed up. I was uh -huh. young and stupid, and anyway. So I got bitten pretty badly. I had to go to the hospital. I had surgery. Bones were broken. I was pretty bad. I had surgery in my hand. I'm thinking, this is awful. There's nothing good is going to come of this. You know, I, my arm in a cast. It hurt like heck. I'm 25 years old. I'm thinking, this is horrible. And, I, and then they rolled me down to physical therapy because I had to learn to use my hand again. They sewed that thing back together. And the door opened. My physical therapist walked in, and I don't know if this has ever happened to you, where all of a sudden everything around that person goes foggy, and you hear like, <laughs> I got scared at first because I thought, oh my God, the bite was worse than I thought. I've died and I've gone to heaven because there's an angel standing in front of me. She came over to me and she goes, hi, I want to be your therapist. And I just went, thank you, God, thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> She made me all better, and a year later, I married her. Oh, my God. I would never have met my wife of 28 years had it not been for a crocodile biting me on the hand. So the other lesson is, no matter what happens to you in life, there's a good reason for it. Just wait. Patience. Wow. That's a great story. Lucky. That's, Lucky. That's like the best wedding story Learn how to make heard. lemonade <laughs> out of lemons. That's what my father used to always say. Always learn to make lemonade out of lemons. That is awesome. That is such a good story. Now, your website is, is still... It's crashed, yes. Oh, my God. Don't even go to it. It'll be up sometime soon. But don't worry about but it now. It, when it's ready, it'll be ronmcgill.com. Ron yes. yeah. But we can find you through Zoom Miami. Oh, Zoom Miami. Zoom Miami and uh, Nikon Ambassador page. There's a Nikon Ambassador page, too, through Nikon Do you USA. Know, what is that? Nikon, Nikon, Nikon USA. Just Nikon dot, USA. Dot com. Yeah, Nikon USA. Okay. Com. okay, cool. Go to the Ambassador page. Awesome. Thank you so much for my being My pleasure. The Thanks show. for the invitation. And remember to check the show notes at understandphotography.com. We're going to put this on YouTube and on iTunes. And show then notes? We get the, the show notes. My God, this is like a class. <laughs> And while you're on our website, remember, look around. We've got hundreds of good articles. And remember, our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical so the articles are written towards non-technical people. And then come here next week on the Facebook, uh, Understand Photography Facebook page and watch us live, the Understand Photography show. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for watching episode number 61 with Ron McGill. We'll see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like down below and subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much. We really want to continue to bring awesome photographers onto the Understand Photography Show.